Good morning and welcome to Brookings. Uh, I'm glad to see you, all of you here today. I am delighted this morning to introduce Carolyn Colvin, Acting Commissioner of the Social Security Administration, and Rich Cordray, the Director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Commission, Commissioner Colvin has been leading the Social Security Administration since February of 2013. She was previously Deputy Commissioner, confirmed by the Senate in December 2010, and before that held key positions at the organization since 1994. She is also a trustee of the Social Security Board of Trustees. Rich Cordray is the inaugural director of the CFPB and previously led the Bureau's Enforcement Division. Like Commissioner Colvin, he has significant experience in state and local government, including serving as Ohio's Attorney General just before joining the Bureau. Commissioner Colvin and Director Cordray are here to talk to us uh, today about the importance of planning for retirement and to announce the results of a recent interagency collaboration. As we all know, a secure and comfortable retirement requires us to start preparing early on. But there are obstacles towards planning for retirement. Part of the problem concerns, concerns the basic income insecurity and financial frag fragility facing many Americans. A recent Brookings study found that about one-third of U.S. households spend all of their available resources in every pay period. Another recent study of ours found that one-quarter of U.S. survey respondents reported that they are certain they cannot come up with $2,000 in 30 days. Another part of the problem concerns psychological factors that limit our ability to make long-term decisions in our own best interests. There's a good deal of information about savings vehicles and financial calculators out there, but many people don't use the available tools and many undersave as a result in the years leading up to retirement. We're lucky today to have the commissioner and the director here to shed some light on this issue and to help us understand what policymakers and the private sector have done and can do to engage in this important topic. In a moment, I'll turn the stage over to our guests. After they give their remarks, we'll see special presentations from both the CFPB and the Social Security Administration. And then my colleague, Josh Gottbaum, uh, will moderate a discussion with Commissioner Colvin and Director Cordray. After that, we'll hear, hear from a panel of experts, uh, Jonelle Mart of the Washington Post, Olivia Mitchell of the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, and Jean Setzfind of AARP. So I think, without further ado, I think Commissioner Colvin is going first. So I welcome both the Commissioner and the Director. But Commissioner Colvin, welcome to Brookings, and take it away. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm so pleased to have the opportunity to speak to you today. And it's good to be here with uh, the uh, director, uh, Cadre, um, and uh, so many others that I see who have worked uh, in this area for a very long time. I certainly want to commend the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and all of you for the work that you do every day to educate, protect, and empower consumers in your communities across the nation so that they can take control of their own economic lives. Financial security is a preeminent national issue, and Social Security's insurance protection is the foundation of retirement security for American workers and families. We must work together to keep Social Security strong and to promote retirement planning and financial literacy to workers of all ages. In championing the concept of Social Security during his message to Congress in 1934, Franklin, President Franklin Roosevelt said, quote, these three great objectives, the security of the home, the security of livelihood, and the security of social insurance are a minimum of the promise that we can offer to the American people. They constitute a right which belongs to every individual and every family willing to work, end of quote. Eight decades later, President Roosevelt's words continue to urge us forward. This year, we're celebrating the 80th anniversary of Social Security. For eight decades, Social Security has helped American workers and families navigate the economic challenges of life. We are able to provide a degree of economic security for them in retirement or if they become disabled. We are also what we often call the face of government for most Americans especially for those who are vulnerable after a loss of income when they have an unexpected disability or death occurs or when reaching retirement age. 
Our 80th anniversary gives us the opportunity to reflect on the incredible part our agency plays in the lives of millions of people every day. Those of us who serve in the agency feel especially honored to have so active a role in this important milestone. In September this year, our agency pays Social Security benefits to almost 60 million individuals, constituting about one-fifth of the American population and serving as that basic protection to support working men and women, children, people with disabilities, and the elderly. About 168 million workers are earning Social Security coverage by paying taxes on their earnings. Workers pay 6.2% of their earnings to finance the Social Security system, and employers pay a matching amount. More than two-thirds, or 40 million, of these beneficiaries are retired workers or their dependents. However, many workers paying into Social Security know little about how the system works or what they need to do on their own to get ready for retirement. It is important to note that for the average worker, Social Security replaces only about 40% of pre-retirement earnings. However, the impact is about more than just numbers. Data from the U.S. Census Bureau show that Social Security is by far the most effective poverty prevention program in the United States. Our retirement benefits and benefits from life insurance and disability insurance for working families keep 22 million Americans from falling into poverty. These beneficiaries include 1 million children, 15 million seniors, and 6 million adults under 65, who include early retirees, disabled workers, and widowed mothers and fathers caring for children or workers who have died. Few government agencies touch as many lives as the Social Security Administration, and is the magnitude of the program, combined with the impact it has on individuals, that reminds us of how valuable and valued Social Security has been since its very beginning. We are enormously proud to serve the American people in this capacity. The Social Security program has long enjoyed the overwhelming support of the nation's citizens and bipartisan political leaders. We know their confidence comes with the expectation that we will oversee and faithfully manage the resources people need us to provide. Legislation signed by President Obama on November 2nd averted a near-term shortfall in the disability insurance program. Without enactment of this small reallocation between the OAS and DI trust funds, there would only have been enough in the DI trust fund to pay a little over 80% of benefits by December of next year. The DI fund will now be able to pay full benefits into 2022. This reallocation did not change the date when reserves are depleted in the OASI fund, which remains 2034. Social Security is a family program, and the same workers and their families benefit from both funds. As we look at longer-term solutions, we must remember that Social Security serves the entire family. There are survivor benefits for each child left behind. There are widow's benefits and spousal benefits. And then there are disability benefits for individuals who have disabilities and are unable to work before they reach retirement. Social Security is not going broke. Our agency and our programs are needed now more than ever. There's no better time than now to engage the American people in a conversation about how to keep Social Security strong. Public opinion polls conducted by nonpartisan firms show bipartisan support across demographics. Over the decades, such polls have consistently reflected the faith and confidence Americans have in Social Security. Year after year, significant majorities of respondents consider Social Security crucial for their economic stability and even a major source of their income in retirement. Public opinion studies show Americans value Social Security and are willing to pay more if necessary to preserve it for future generations. There is a striking agreement across age, income, groups, and even across party affiliation. While we are mindful of current and approaching challenges, we see these as opportunities to continue delivering excellent service to Americans. It is our goal to serve our customers where they want to receive service. Some come to our field offices and others prefer to use the internet. 
Some of you may already receive Social Security benefits and others may plan to do so someday. Either way, you will want a My Social Security account to meet many of your needs. How many in the audience have uh, an, a My Social Security account? Oh, fantastic. Okay. Now, you know uh, with the uh, My Social Security account, you can keep track of your earnings and verify them each year. You can get an estimate of your future benefits if you are still working. You can get a replacement SSA 1099 or SSA 1042 for tax season. And you can view your Social Security statement online and, of course, get many other uh, actions there. Uh, soon you'll be able to get a Social Security replacement card. We take the security of the public's information very seriously and continually use a proactive approach to ensure the security of our online services. I have one myself, and over 21 million people have used the portal for more than 140 million transactions. In addition to using their My Social Security account, visitors to socialsecurity.gov can take advantage of our online retirement estimator to see what their benefits would be for different retirement scenarios. And this is important, and we hope that more people will begin to go and use the retirement estimator. The retirement estimator estimates monthly benefits based on actual Social Security earnings. The benefit for spouses calculator computes the effect of filing for early retirement on spouses benefits. The early or late retirement calculator computes the effects on benefit amounts if a person files for early or delayed retirement benefits. And the life expectancy calculator gives a person an idea of how long benefits may need to last. So for more information about our online tools, please visit ssa.gov planners. Younger generations can find a wealth of information geared especially for them by going to socialsecurity.gov and selecting information for young people. Here they can learn about the magic of compound interest, watch an engaging video about Social Security called Social Security 101, what's in it for me, and much more. And I mentioned this about the young people because I recently had a colleague uh, share with me that his daughter had gotten her first job and she was so excited when she got her first check. And she came home and she said, Dad, who is FICA? What's this FICA? And it was just amazing that someone uh, in this country could get a job and not realize that a portion of their wages would be uh, taxed for the future insurance protection that Social Security affords. So we have a lot of work to do with the young people. Our agency continues to manage the Social Security program with integrity and rigor, mindful of our responsibility as stewards of the program's trust funds, the taxpayers' monies, and the public faith, our public's faith in our oversight. Now, Social Security was not meant to be the only source of income in retirement. It is essential to start saving and investing as early as possible for your retirement. Most of us aspire to do more than just get by when the time comes to stop working. No matter what you earn, careful planning can help ensure that you have more than your monthly Social Security payment when you retire. By helping the public understand what they can realistically expect from Social Security, remember, 40% of pre-retirement pre earnings, we hope to encourage more workers to get serious about putting money away for the future. And this includes taking advantage of a workplace retirement plan for those who have one available to them. Now, for those who do not have an employer pension program, we're partnering with the Department of Treasury to let workers know about the President's MyRA investment option. Last year, President Obama announced the MyRA accounts, a simple, safe, and affordable starter retirement savings account that is offered through employers and will help millions of Americans begin to save for retirement. It's an innovative financial instrument that lets low and middle income earners invest after tax dollars in government savings bonds, whether or not they have access to another retirement plan. My RA will allow all workers to invest as long as their household income is below $191,000 a year. Initial investments can be as low as $25, and workers can contribute as little as $5 at a time through automatic payroll deduction. Now, since it's not tied to a particular employer, 
workers can hold on to their MyRA account when they move from one job to another. And in addition, MyRA is free of any fees. For more information about MyRA, please visit the website at myra.treasury.gov or myra.gov. We must all commit to engaging our communities in these kinds of discussions to help educate and raise awareness about Social Security and planning for retirement. I think our biggest, the biggest thing that we can do is to educate and inform. When President Franklin Roosevelt signed the Social Security Act back in 1935, the nation was battling the most serious economic crisis in history. Now, a lot has changed. President Roosevelt inspired us as a nation, and he built for the future. We must do the same. We must act on our vision for the future, encouraging solvency for Social Security and as individuals by saving for not just our own, but also generations to come. Thank you again for joining us, and later I'd be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. So I was very glad <clears throat> a few minutes ago to clap what I hoped was loudest and longest for Commissioner Colvin uh, for doing something I thought was both brave and generous, which is agreeing to work with another agency on a joint uh, project. And when I came in, Josh uh, said to me, having a lot of experience in high positions in government himself, that this is an unusual thing. Uh, it means people have to put aside their notions of prerogative and turf and work together uh, and I have found that their team, she and her team at Social Security Administration, have been great partners to us, and I hope and expect and intend that we have been great partners uh, to you, and together we've formed a greater team that's neither your team nor my team but our team, uh, and today uh, marks the, the beginnings of the fruits of those labors, but much more to come as we jointly work to promote uh, the tools we're going to talk about uh, today. As has been noted, and I noted that it's now in the actual Social Security Administration logo, uh, this year marks the 80th anniversary of the Social Security Act. Uh, as Franklin Roosevelt said in 1934, and when you began to quote him, I was worried that you were going to use the same quote that I was going to use, but there was much in that speech, apparently. Uh, he also said, quote, old age is at once the most certain and for many people the most tragic of all hazards. There's no tragedy in growing old, but there is tragedy in growing old without means of support, which is exactly what the Social Security Administration has done to ride to the rescue uh, of so many millions of Americans over so many years now. Uh, actually, at the time he wrote, there was not much certainty in attaining a ripe old age. Probably many hardworking people who began making their first contributions to Social Security out of their paychecks in that era were not at all sure that they would survive to reach the age threshold for receiving benefits later in life. But times have changed, as most notably have the expected lifespans of the vast majority of Americans. And these changes have made Social Security all the more central to the financial lives of older Americans, more central than ever before. It's an honor for me to be here today alongside my colleagues who are stalwart champions of our seniors and do so much to make sure they get the support they need to manage the ways and means of their lives. As we're all well aware, we've recently come through the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. Many Americans were shaken in the deeply held belief that if they work hard and act responsibly, they can get ahead and retire securely. Millions of Americans lost their jobs, millions lost their homes, and almost all of us lost a substantial chunk of our life savings, our retirement savings. In the aftermath of the crisis, this country had to make a new beginning. The new Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is part of that fresh start. And just like when FDR championed the Social Security Administration after the great, during the Great Depression, the Consumer Bureau is here to help make financial life more sound and more secure for vast numbers of Americans. We're very busy addressing key problems in consumer financial markets, and we're working to create a more sustainable marketplace where consumers are treated fairly, consumers are better informed, and consumers can find value in responsible and sustainable business practices. 
The financial reform law that created our new agency specifically recognized the need to protect older Americans against financial exploitation and promote economic security later in life. With the rapid aging of the current baby boomer generation, this mission is now more important than ever before. We are experiencing the graying of America with statistics that have now become familiar to many of us. 45 million people in this country who are already at age 65 or older, and 10,000 more are turning 65 each day. They are our grandparents, our parents, our neighbors, our friends, and they're living longer, healthier lives than ever before. The average American is now spending about 20 years in retirement. I heard the other day that in 1950, they, the average was about four years in retirement. During these years, they, they remain active consumers. They are still taking out and making payments on mortgages. They're still borrowing to buy cars and trucks. They're still accumulating credit card debt. Some are even taking out student loans on behalf of their children and grandchildren. These heavier debt loads, which previous generations did not necessarily have, can threaten their economic security. Our Office for Older Americans has done much great work around retirement security. Our team has traveled the country listening to seniors. Based on what we've heard, we've issued studies, guides, and advisories to arm older Americans and their caregivers with the information and tools they need to protect themselves and their precious retirement savings. The work that is focused on older Americans is, is in addition to the tools and resources we're developing for all consumers. For example, for those who feel disempowered by the confusing explanations offered by many financial products, we've created our Ask CFPB tool. This interactive database has now has over 1,000 answers to questions most commonly asked us by consumers. When you encounter a particular issue, when it happens to arise in your own life, you can go to Ask CFPB to learn more about it and understand your rights. Today, we're adding to this set of tools and resources with Planning for Retirement, which is an interactive online tool designed to help people as they decide when to, they decide when to claim their Social Security benefits. This tool, built in collaboration with the Social Security Administration, gives consumers the information and confidence they need to make a well-informed choice when it comes to deciding at what age they should elect to begin taking their payments. Millions of Americans are likely to face some amount of financial insecurity in their lengthening retirement years. To a consumer, when to start claiming Social Security payments is one of the key decisions they can make about their retirement. Because this is a one-time choice, it's imperative that consumers can properly weigh their options with all the relevant information and factors in mind. Americans are eligible to claim Social Security retirement benefits without any reduction, this is where it starts to become a little complicated, when they reach what the Social Security Administration calls the full retirement age. For people born after 1942, their full retirement age ranges from 66 to 67, depending on the year the person was born. But consumers can begin to claim their benefits at other points as well, starting either several years before or several years after their full retirement age. The outcome is not the same, however, depending on when you opt to claim your benefits. The earlier you claim your benefits, the less money you will receive each month. If instead you wait to claim your benefits later, you actually get more money per month. Because this is a one-time choice, the amount of each payment you will receive generally does not change later on aside from cost of living increases. So if a consumer claims the reduced benefit now, then generally they will receive that reduced amount for the rest of their lives. Today we're releasing a report which shows that many consumers are not taking advantage of the choices they have to get a higher lifetime income to secure their retirements. This is true in spite of the great importance of the choices that consumers can make about the timing of claiming their Social Security benefits. The report highlights the fact that many Americans are collecting early despite living longer lives. Indeed, studies show that nearly half of all retirees start collecting their benefits at their earliest eligibility age, which is 62 years old. In 2013, nearly three-quarters of Americans claimed benefits before their full retirement age, and 46% claimed them at the first possible moment when they turned 62. Yet many Americans must now stretch those benefit payments over a longer period since those reaching the age of 65 today will live on average to age 85 and perhaps even longer if the current trends continue. This means consumers who are retiring today will likely need sufficient income and savings to cover 20 years or more that they will be spending in retirement. 
One of the means that people can better understand these choices is by signing up, as, as Commissioner Colvin said, for a My Social Security account online. And by the way, I have done it. My wife and I have done it. It is very easy to do. When we talk about tools that government creates for people, this is an easy tool to use. People should do that, and then they have direct access to a lot of information about their Social Security uh, that they will need and want in the coming years. The report that we are issuing today also highlights the well-known problem that many of the people who are at and near retirement age are unprepared financially. For example, four in 10 of the late boomers, people like myself, who currently fall in the 51 to 59 age range, are reaching retirement with limited or no savings and are projected to face a savings shortfall. And with declining coverage from traditional pension plans, another notable fact of this generation that pay a regular monthly payment, Social Security is the only guaranteed monthly income for a majority of older consumers, which means retirees are coming to rely on it more and more. In fact, approximately two-thirds of the nearly 40 million Americans aged 65 and older who receive Social Security benefits depend on those benefits for half or more of their retirement income. Social Security is particularly important for the growing number of beneficiaries who are age 80 and older. My father is 97, since it accounts for about 70% or more of their income. Studies have shown that the people who claim their Social Security benefits before their full retirement age typically have more limited knowledge of their benefits and available claiming options than those who claim at their full retirement age or after. Indeed, several recent studies show that many non-retirees are either confused or lack basic knowledge about Social Security. For example, one study found that only 22% of pre-retirees knew their full retirement age. Only 12% knew how their benefits would change if they claimed at, before, or after that age. And only about 5% of those surveyed knew how their benefits are calculated. This tells us that misunderstanding and confusion about the facts are hindering many Americans as they try to make informed decisions about this key element of their retirement futures, yet another reason for everyone to sign up for your own My Social Security account. <clears throat> We're now undertaking novel efforts to help older Americans cope with these problems. The Consumer Bureau's work closely with the Social Security Administration to offer the new Planning for Retirement tool that we're unveiling today. As we developed this tool, we found ourselves thinking about consumers in their 50s who are starting to become more aware of their Social Security benefits. They're beginning to consider the timing of their possible decisions around retirement, such as when to stop working, when to downsize their home, and when to tap into any 401k or IRA benefits they may have built up over the years. Because many of these decisions are harder or more expensive to reverse once they have been made, we found it would be important to engage people who are in their early 50s when they still have flexibility to plan ahead in targeting their claiming age. The bottom line is that retirement is an increasingly complex process with multiple decision points. As a result, our new tool is interactive and allows people to make their own estimates based on their own circumstances. The decision they must make about when to claim Social Security requires estimates of longevity, inflation, current savings, and interest rates, and it requires calculations about planning and budgeting. That's quite a bit of complexity. With our new tool, consumers can also plug in their date of birth and their highest annual work income to see their estimated Social Security benefits. By simply plugging in their information, people can more easily see the trade-offs they could make in weighing key decisions like when to start claiming their benefits against other decisions they might make about working longer or cashing out available assets. Thus, the tool enables people to consider alternative scenarios. They can assess the long-range effects of this one-time decision because the tool shows how their estimated benefits will accumulate over time depending on when they first began to claim those benefits. They can also see the effects of other life factors. The tool provides tips on claiming options depending on marital status, other expected sources of income, plans for working longer, and general expectations of longevity. For example, because surviving spouses receive the higher of the two spouses' benefits, it may make sense for the higher earning spouse to claim at their full retirement age or after in order to get the highest possible benefit and minimize the reduction in income that a surviving spouse may later experience. When we designed this tool, we looked at changing trends and how different consumers access information. We developed a tool that is optimized for mobile use. We also created a Spanish version of the tool because Spanish speakers are expected to be one of the fastest growing segments of the population that will be making the claiming decision by the year 2050. For this group, our tool will offer an additional resource to their limited sources of information on this issue.
It also matters enormously that this new tool comes from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which is increasingly known as a source that offers people neutral and unbiased information. Our only goal with this tool is to inform, educate, and empower Americans to make the best decisions they can for themselves and their loved ones. We want consumers who use our tool to know and understand what it means to claim at their full retirement age versus several years before or several years after. Most people will see that even allowing their benefits to grow for one more year can make a big difference, as they usually will get 5 to 8 percent more in benefits each year they wait to claim after age 62. A higher monthly benefit may matter more when they are older. Other sources of income and savings may already de be de depleted, and Social Security plays a more central role in their retirement income, as we've seen that it does. In general, consumers should engage in basic budget planning. They should be aware of how much money comes in and goes out each month. As they near retirement, they should consider both their actual income and expenses before retirement and their expected income and expenses after retirement. This can help them see how a lesser or greater level of benefits will affect their ability to meet their needs when they are no longer working. In addition, this kind of budgeting can help them decide if they need to reduce their expenses and pay off any debts before deciding to retire. Consumers may find that it pays to keep working if they can. Staying in the workforce, full or part-time, even for one or two more years, can increase Social Security benefits by replacing prior years with low or no earnings. It also allows more time to save for retirement. Alongside the Social Security Administration, we want to make life better for older consumers. Both agencies were born out of financial crises, and together we're both driven to help people put themselves in position to make the most of their financial circumstances. As the American economy continues to recover, we want consumers of all ages to be able to look ahead with hope and resilience. We want to remind them that they still have the formidable Social Security Administration working to support their economic security. But now they also have the new Consumer Bureau standing on their side and looking out for their interests as we work to help restore confidence and trust in the consumer financial marketplace. As we can see here today, this partnership makes for a great combination. I would now like to turn it over to Jean Ku, the head of the consumer engagement uh, role at the Bureau, who will be giving us a demo of the Planning for Retirement tool. And thank you to Jean and his team, and to the Social Security Administration and our joint team. Thank you. Thank you, Director Cordray. Uh, as Director Porter just mentioned, my name is Gene Koo, and I lead the CFPB's Office for Consumer Engagement. And at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, we provide tools and resources to help consumers make informed financial decisions for themselves and their family. And today I will be uh, demonstrating one of those tools that Director Gorgia just described to you. Um, as as uh, was mentioned earlier, sooner or later, most consumers do have the opportunity to move from their working lives to life in retirement, and a very important decision most of us will have to make is when to start claiming Social Security retirement benefits. And deciding when to start claiming Social Security payments is critical because it affects both the monthly and the total amount of benefits that a person receives. And two out of three people who receive Social Security rely on it for more than half of their income in retirement. And yet, despite how important these benefits are, many people claim them relying on limited or incorrect information. And so we'll hear more from our panelists in a little bit about why that might be, but I want to share with you one way the CFPB is working to narrow this knowledge gap. <clears throat> we want to make sure that consumers have access to ac accurate information about their monthly and lifetime benefits when claiming at, before, or, at, or after full retirement age. And we want consumers to understand the life factors that might affect their decision, including their marital status, how long they plan to work, their likely expenses in retirement, other expected sources of income, and their life expectancy. And at the CFPB, we want consumers to be in control of their financial lives because everyone deserves to have financial well-being in their later years. And so this is the CFPB's newest online resource, Planning for Retirement. It's a simple and friendly way for consumers to consider when they might want to claim Social Security retirement benefits. We designed it using the latest research on what people need to know to make the best choices for themselves and their families about claiming Social Security. So the first thing you'll do is to enter your birth date and annual work income. And let's use a hypothetical consumer who will turn 50 today. And 
at the at the pre at present the uh, median income for folks who are 25 and older is 32,140. And uh, let me just pause here to point out that we're not accessing anybody's actual earnings records, and you'll notice we're not asking for any um, social security numbers or name or anything identifying them. Um, part of the reason is, uh, is we also wanted to make this really as, as fast and easy for consumers as possible, and this is really an educational tool to help consumers understand the choices between on, on their claiming age, not their exact number that they might expect to, to receive uh, when, they, when they start claiming. Um, so one thing I learned by poking around the Social Security Administration's website is that the most popular girl's name uh, in 1965 is Lisa. And so we'll be uh, calling our hypothetical consumer Lisa here. There's a lot of really interesting facts in there. It turns out Jean is not ever in the top 100 of most popular names. Okay, so Lisa will see this interactive graph, and based on her date of birth and income, her full retirement age is 67, and her estimated monthly benefit at full retirement age can be about 12, oh, it's right there on that line, but you can barely see, it's $1,268. And Lisa can adjust her claiming age to see what her options are and how her benefit increases and decreases based on claiming age. So let's start and slide her claiming age down to the earliest possible option. I get my mouse to work. There we go. First time actually grabbing this thing. There we go. All right. <clears throat> So she can see that her monthly benefits go down to 898, and her lifetime benefits also go down to 247,848. But if she moves her claiming age up to the maximum at age 70, her monthly total benefits can be as high as 1,572 or 282,960 total by age 85. And so we know that for many people, the decision about when to begin claiming Social Security is about more than just the numbers. So in step two, we provide personalized information about other factors a consumer might consider. So each of the questions here allows someone like Lisa to reflect on her own situation, whether she's married, so like yes here, whether she plans on continuing to work into her 60s. And as Lisa answers these questions, she'll receive personalized information based on her situation, and she can read about those topics in detail or just look at the top line summary. Some other factors might include whether she thinks her expenses will decrease after she retires. Not quite sure. Um, whether she has savings going into retirement, and whether she expects to live a long life. We know that for many people, uh, there's a preformed idea about when they'll move from their working lives to life in retirement, whether it's based on people they know or just conventional wisdom. Now that Lisa has seen this graph in step one and read about factors related to her situation in step two, this last step encourages her to really think about the age at which she might begin claiming. So let's say she now decides that she's going to think about age 67, her full retirement age. Here we show her three simple, easy to remember next steps she can take to move her plans forward. And our research suggests that this final step also helps solidify what consumers have learned by going through this exercise. We know that Spanish speakers across the country also experience the knowledge gap that I mentioned earlier. And so to reach this growing segment of the population, we also made this tool available in Spanish. We also optimize this tool for consumers who are increasingly accessing the internet on mobile devices. So planning for retirement works great on both tablets and on smartphones. Through planning for retirement, we're helping people avoid surprises and plan for financial well-being into their later years. When we tested this resource with consumers, we found that people left with plans to talk with their spouses, began to consider savings accounts, and generally, felt more informed about their options. And we're excited for everyone to have this experience. I know that a lot of you out there are educating the public about retirement and about Social Security, and we encourage you to consider sharing our Planning for Retirement tool. And if you want to learn more, 
Here's an email address that you can reach us at, CFPB underscore older Americans at CFPB.gov. And we have promotional materials in the back of the room for you to share as well. And you may know that the Spanish word for retirement is jubilación, or jubilation, which is a beautiful word to describe what many of us hope to have in our later years. <laughs> and we hope that the CFPB's new offering will let more Americans have many jubilant years ahead. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Robin Sabatino. I'm the Associate Commissioner for the Office of Electronic Services and Technology at Social Security. And I just have to say that I think I have the best job at the agency because I get to develop things um, that, like what I'm about to show you um, and work with age, other agencies and um, uh, private sector organizations to, um, to message our uh, our applications. Um, Commissioner Colvin already spoke about some of the things that we do, but I just want to um, share with you uh, what we have available on the portal right now. This is continually changing and expanding, um, but right now we have the online statement, um, which um, before we had to uh, request it, you got it in the mail, and now it is all, all the time available. Um, actually, folks who have registered for the and have an account, they get a reminder email about three months before their birthday to let them know that it's it's there. But again, they can access it at any time. Uh, Commissioner Colvin indicated we have over 21 million registered accounts, and I saw the hands that didn't go up. So I'm sure that after uh, this third messaging of the My Social Security portal, that you will want to go home and. Um, sign up yourself and get us closer to 22 million. Um, change of address, um, those receiving social security benefits can go in and change their address using the portal and not have to go into a field office or call the 800 number. Um, the, change with the, the same with changing your direct deposit, you can do that online. Check your benefits provides information on social security, SSI and Medicare. Um, the benefit verification letter um, this provides a letter you can get printing documentation that, says, that indicates whether you are or are not receiving benefits. A lot of times folks go into a field office and have to verify their benefits to apply for other um, types of assistance. Um, we're coming up on tax time, um, and that will be a very busy time for our replacement 1099 and 1042 forms. Um, again, you don't have to request them. You can actually um, get them and print them online. And the downloadable statement, which I will speak to a little bit um, in depth later, but this provides this, the uh, Social Security statement in a downloadable XML format that can be uploaded to other software. <clears throat> and then we have the Medicare replacement card. You can request a Medicare replacement card online. So these are the benefits, the uh, applications we currently have behind the portal. Um, and we are continuing to add things. Um, and Commissioner mentioned one of them that's coming. That's her personal favorite, I think, is the Social Security number replacement card. So if you have a, my Social Security account, um, you're over the age of 18, you have a driver's license or an ID from a participating state, um, you have a domestic mailing address, and you have a, a, you're requesting a replacement card with no changes, you're not changing your name, you're not getting married, those kinds of things, then you will be able to use this application. Um, we're going to do a slow controlled rollout of this application. As, as Commissioner Colvin indicated, security is very important to us, so we do want to make sure that the application is secure, and we want to do the rollout slowly. So we're gonna, we have um, six states that we will use during this first um, rollout period, um, and this will be released on November 28th. Okay. The next one is Smart Claim. Um, you know we have several applications that are available to do uh, through the internet. 
They are not yet behind the portal. Smart claim will change that. Smart claim is going to move it behind the portal, but it's also going to create a unified application so you don't have to do them all separately. It'll use intelligent pathing to um, help you file for whatever benefits you're eligible for. Um, this will be a multi-year multi effort, um, but in calendar year 16, we will have um, the My Application Status or My Apps application behind the portal. Um, and that individuals who've already applied can go online and check the status of their application. The next one would be um, My SSI. So we don't currently have an SSI application online, and that will be our first um, piece of SMART claim. So we're very excited about this one. Uh, moving it behind the portal will um, enable additional um, security. It will be, so therefore you'll be able to get information back. So you'll get a, a, you know, an estimate of what your benefit amount would be. We can pull in information from the estimator, from the statement, those kinds of things because you are in a secure environment. So um, again, building on what we have. Okay, and now that we have folks who want to do business with us online, we want to make sure they can stay there and have the tools that will help them um, while they're in the portal. So in 15, we released Dynamic Help and a secure click to call back feature. Dynamic Help is when you're in the application, it, it, it engages in a couple of ways. If you're in an application and they see that you're sitting there for a while, um, they'll give you some frequently asked questions to try to help you um, get through it. Um, or you can, or an avatar would pop up and say, you know, Carolyn, do you need help with something? Um, because it'll know who you are because of, of your login and you can type in a question and then it'll give you, um, a, again, some, um, some FAQs to go um, along with that question. Or if it still didn't answer your question, you, re you can request for someone to call you back. Um, so you enter your question and your phone number and someone will call you back. Um, in 16 and beyond, we have the message center. Um, we're gonna move to click to chat in calendar year 16. Um, and um, we will have a, a message center that we can do online notices and secure messaging, secure email. Okay, and then just a little data on dynamic help. Um, we have gotten a lot of usage of this. Um, <clears throat> we've had um, significant uptake on the uh, click to call back as well. So um, again, very um, interactive. This is something that's coming, and this is registration appointment and services for representatives. Um, we have a huge workload in the field offices um, and multiple systems. This is going to pull them all in together um, and then feed the information into all of our downstream systems so they don't have to re-enter information. And then a little bit more information on the statement. Um, it was a joint effort between OMB Treasury and Social Security, um, the data will be um, XML format so that it can be downloaded and shared with financial planners so that they can incorporate it and pull it into their financial planning software. And then SSA Express, this is my, my last item. Um, you know, we want to get out in the community and share what we have with folks. So we have three different um, initiatives here. Um, customer service stations is a kiosk-like um, uh, piece of hardware where they can actually access my social security and do their transactions out in the community. We have seven of these right now in a proof of concept. Um, the satisfaction rate of folks using these out in the community is about 98%. So um, they're really happy um, with the service they receive. Self-help personal computers, we have over 700 of these out in the field offices where folks, again, if they wanna start instead of waiting, if they wanna start the work and, and work on the self-help personal computers, they can do that and, and as well as get some assistance in the field office from the employees. And Desktop Icon is, we're partnering with um, community agencies um, and we put the icon on their computers so that they, while they're doing business like at VA or in a social service agency, um, they, instead of going into a field office, they can also um, do social security business while they're there and save them the travel. All right. I know I'm out of time here, so... Um
Thank you. Okay, I am too. Actually, the, they actually don't trust us to turn on our own mics, <laughs> which is, I think, wise, and is actually the point about these automatic tools, yes? Um, as Director Cordray noted at the beginning, part of the reason that we at Brookings and the Retirement Security Project were encouraged by this is because what you are do what each of these agencies is trying to do is to help people better manage yes. their retirement before they actually retire right uh, so we're we're thrilled with this uh, I was going to ask you a couple of questions ab about this effort and then a little and then frankly give you a chance to talk about what else is there what else is there to be done and then we'll open it up to questions mm -hmm. so so Obviously, getting agencies to work together is not easy. How, give us a little background, if you can. How, how long have you been working on, the, on this effort? How long did it take? Uh, you want me to go? Well, um, we believe that it's very important for agencies to collaborate. Uh, you know, the president talks about one government, and we really believe that. And we believe that um, customer service is better when we have cross-agency uh, collaboration. So it took us about a year. Um, and uh, the biggest challenge is always um, uh, our systems being able to talk to one another uh, because generally they're developed to be able to uh, meet our own internal needs. And so being able to talk across agencies was very important. But I think because we all believe in the importance of this issue, um, we came to the table with the idea of how do we make it work. Yeah, I, I would say that uh, my... my uh, experience of it has been the Social Security Administration probably feels the one government uh, mentality more than just about anyone else, in part because every other piece of the government is filled with employees who themselves are part of the Social Security system uh, and serves the public, different segments of the public, some, some of them all the public, all of whom or, or many of whom are themselves uh, looking forward to and, and, and to whom Social Security is relevant. So there's a way in which by, by uh, reaching out to Social Security Administration, we found that we kind of hit the jackpot among uh, an organization that is more externally focused uh, and willing to work across jurisdictional lines, which, which again, as you noted, Josh, is not easy in government. And again, looking at your background, I mean, there's, there's other players here that are quite significant. There's the Pension Benef Benefit Guarantee Corporation, there's the Department of Treasury, there's the Department of Labor has roles to play. Uh, the IRS has roles to play around particularly the uh, types of IRAs and, and uh, other, of course, labor has, has ERISA plans and the like. So it, it's already, a, although it's one government, there's various pieces of the government, it's already a sort of complicated tapestry for most people to try to get their hands on. Uh, and, and another thing, I, I wanted to echo uh, the commissioner's comments earlier where she mentioned the MyRA uh, uh, effort that is underway at Treasury. This is a savings and retirement account that is going to be open to all Americans uh, of, of low, moderate, and to some extent fairly high uh, income levels, household income levels, almost up to $200,000. And it, 
will give an option to the so, so many people out there do not have access to retirement in the same way as full-time, full-salary employees do. Even at private corporations that have retirement plans for their workforce, it's only accessible to some. And anybody who is a part-time worker or a contract worker or a seasonal worker or an intermittent worker uh, or, or anybody who is not full-time, full-salary typically does not have access to that, and they need an ability to build toward retirement themselves. If you think about it, and we've talked a lot in this country in the last uh, few years about the income inequality, that's one thing. Multiply that through the fact that many Americans have little access to retirement through, through their workplace, and then they have to do it on their own, which is hard for many people to do through IRA accounts and the like. You have retirement inequality, which is much greater. And so the tools, the kinds of things we're working on here feel to us all the more important uh, to the broad segment of Americans. I would like to add, though, it's not just uh, government um, that um, needs to be involved in this effort. And we've been very fortunate to have our um, community partners, our other stakeholders, you know, organizations like the Women's Institute for a Secure Retirement Wiser or the American Savings and Education Council, and many others that I'm not um, naming here. Uh, we work very uh, closely with uh, many of the uh, aging uh, organizations as well as the uh, disability organizations. We are now beginning to reach out to more of the uh, millennium groups like the, um, I forgot what the names are, uh, but to, to work with them and see how we can reach them because there's always been this discussion about intergenerational uh, gaps and um, you know, early on we had this discussion about uh, the young versus the old, and we really wanted to make sure that people understood that this was really a family uh, benefit, and therefore retirement was very important, uh, that the more the um, uh, population plans for retirement, the less children will have as far as the responsibility to their parents. And so when um, we hear young people talk about, well, Social Security, be there for me, uh, me when I need it and that there's really no sense in planning for retirement. We're able to show them that it's there for them right now, that uh, many of them don't realize that they may experience disability early or that they may um, lose a spouse early. I lost my son when he was just 34 and he left four youngsters behind. Uh, so I think it's important that we really have this partnership with government but also with the community at large and the professionals who work in this field. What? Um one of the challenges is these are complicated decisions. Neither of you has the authority to tell people what to do. So how do you, how far, how far can you go? How far should you go? Um, at what point do you go? How do you decide how much, what's education and what's advice? So that, that's, a, that's a general issue that people often misunderstand about our new agency, I find, is that they have a notion that we have in mind that we're going to tell people what to do, we're going to tell them what choices to make, we're going to try to dictate choices. I don't feel that we're in position to do that. I wouldn't be comfortable doing that, and it wouldn't be appropriate for, for me or our agency to do that, in part because people... There may be other people who are more expert in many things, but people tend to be most expert about their own situations, their own circumstances. What we want to do is give people tools so that they can put in their own information. They can begin to see what kinds of choices they have. They can be better informed about the choices, but ultimately they can make those choices for themselves, and they have to make those choices for themselves. Nobody else is going to care about my situation as much as I am. And therefore, what we try to do is empower people to be in a position to make form form choices. That's exactly what this tool is about. Uh, it's not to not to lecture someone or try to dictate to them. It's to give them the sort of knowledge that you would want to have to make a decision. Most importantly, so that you won't regret later that you didn't know at the time what you later come to know and you wish you had known it at the time and you would have made a different decision. But it's your decision. One thing I would agree, um, these are very personal decisions, and uh, each individual circumstance is very different. Uh, we believe that it's important to uh, give them the information about what the impact will be um, based on the decisions that they make, what the options are, and give them as much information as they can. We're not financial advisors, and I think it would be inappropriate for us to attempt to advise 
But I do think that there's a dearth of information out there and there's a lot of misinformation. So we need to make sure that they ask the right questions uh, and they get the answers to those questions before making a decision, because that decision is going to impact their entire future. And, and let me add to that. Uh, because we are trying to give advice that's informational. We're not trying to give advice that's directional. Uh, ultimately, people have to make the decision for themselves. Part of the problem here is there is no right or wrong answer about any of the questions we're dealing with here today. Much of this depends on estimates and guesses that may turn out to be wrong. Am I going to live to age 85? Lots of people are now, but that doesn't necessarily mean I will or won't, and I don't know. So ultimately, people have to be comfortable making the best judgment they can make given the information they have, knowing that there's a certain amount of uncertainty, uh, but being best able to judge and assess that uncertainty uh, and feel comfortable that they've, they've given it their very best shot and that they knew enough to, to give it that, that best shot. That, that's all really you can ask of people. Uh, and that's another reason why it becomes a very personal decision people need to make for themselves. Um, just go, before I open up to questions from the audience, what other efforts, what other things can government do to help people think about these areas? For example, uh, is the idea of more financial literacy education in elementary schools something that you that your agencies think about? How do, how do you how do you think about ad, what additional steps you might do? Well, I believe that um, we do need to do more in the uh, school system. I've already spoken to some educators about uh, the idea of including this in the curriculum. I just had a recent meeting with the uh, six English-speaking countries and was uh, pleased to note that this is um, part of their uh, ongoing education. They believe that it's important that when uh, young people graduate, I mean, even in, in early um, uh, years of school, that they understand the importance of um, the um, Social Security and other um, economic programs that are available. I know that many of the uh, educators I've spoken to say that their curriculums are already so full that they don't see how they could add anything else on. But I plan to begin to talk to the um, secretary to see if there are some kinds of things that we might do that are not now being done. As I mentioned before, I think it's unthinkable that someone could get to the point where they actually have a job and not understand the basic concept of Social Security, how it's funded, and what it means for them. Uh, and so we have a lot of work to do. So, so when you raised this question, I, I, I kind of leaned in because I'm very passionate on this subject. Uh, just day before yesterday, I was in Los Angeles giving a sermon on this subject to the American Bankers Association, who I feel could do much more. They are respected opinion leaders in the states uh, at getting the states to move toward requiring a certain amount of financial education in the curriculum, particularly some sort of personal financial management course among high school students in order to graduate. Some states are doing that. Every state should be doing that. Uh, it, is, it is really appalling that in this country we continue to send all these young people out into the world and whatever they're going to do in life, whatever they've learned in school, they're going to have to know how to manage their financial affairs. And if they don't do that well, they ruin their lives and they ruin the lives of their families. And they, they end up regretting, as they say, all these things that they might have thought uh, to handle differently. So we have to do it in schools. We have to also recognize that uh, if once we get that solved, and we can solve it, it's just a matter of will, uh, all the adults that are not going to go back to high school, whatever we do, we're not going back to high school, uh, they need something as well. And financial education in the workplace, which is a good, sensible part of a broader benefits package, is quite important. And employers are starting to get very interested in this. Uh, there was an Aon Hewitt study that showed 93% of employers expected that they were going to start moving more in this direction in the next year or two, uh, and it's high time. Uh, it, it's something that we all work together in the federal government. We're, we're all part of the Social Security Administration, and I, our, our agency, and about uh, 21, I think it's 21 agencies are part of the Financial Literacy Education Commission that Congress uh, created. And we work together to make sure that there is uh, efforts being made in the federal government for federal employees. But state governments should do it. Local governments should do it. And in the private sector, this should be done. This should be part of, uh, it's, it's one thing to talk, what we're talking about here today with the Planning for Retirement tool is making sure that you optimize as best you can what money comes in. Uh, 
But then the question is, what do you do with that money? How do you stretch those dollars further? What kind of good decisions do you make as a consumer? Uh, it's really important for people to be able to put themselves in the best position uh, to handle that. Uh, and there's much more we can do. We have an Office of Financial Education that is all about uh, this effort. Uh, and there is increasing attention to it uh, among the public. I think if you have a conversation with anyone, anyone, anywhere across the spectrum, for more than two minutes. They recognize the importance of this. We're teaching high school students history and government pretty much in all 50 states so they can be productive political citizens. Uh, they need to be productive economic <coughs> citizens as well, and that, that's critical. You know, half the people, unfortunately, do not vote, but even the 100% of the people need to be able to manage their economic affairs. Great. Let's, op let's open it up to some questions from the audience. Uh, the Rule at Brookings is very is very simple. One is please state your name and your affiliation if it's relevant, and two, a question is a relatively short collection of words followed by a question mark. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Um, the credibility, Susan. Yes. Yes. I'm June O'Connell, a federal retiree, and the credibility of. Social Security is often cited as, you know, how much money do you have? Will there be in 2033? But my question is actually, doesn't the verbiage about privatizing Social Security in the context where you have pension funds like the Teamsters having to recalculate benefits, don't, doesn't the threat of privatization uh, encourage people in their 50s and 60s to grab what they can now uh, because they're afraid of what will be done legislatively in the future. I As don't think so. The, um, the, the discussion on privatization, I think, has died down. I mean, I think people have seen what has happened uh, with the stock market in, in recent years, and I think that all of the uh, neutral and bipartisan, uh, bipartisan uh, studies that have been undertaken clearly indicate that the majority of the public is pro, opposed to uh, privatization. Um, I certainly think that you're going to always have some degree of discussion about that, but um, the Social Security system is secure. Uh, this was not the first time that there was some discussion about uh, reserves being depleted for either, say, the Disability Trust Fund or uh, the Retirement Trust Fund, and that's why we emphasize the fact that uh, Social Security um, is a family program. and. Uh, it pays both, you know, the disability and retirement and can be to the same worker, uh, just depending upon the circumstances. But I don't think so. I think that uh, more and more as I talk to the young people, uh, we certainly have a lot of work to do. They understand that this is a basic uh, insurance program that they would not be able to get in the private sector. And many of them are working in jobs where there is not a pension for them. Okay. So I don't. I don't think it's. Uh, I don't think it's yes. unique okay. to that yes. issue. I just would say, it, you know, I, I grew up in state and local government, and when I came to Washington, I was sad to learn that there's a lot of politicization about politicization around all of these issues. And I was watching TV the other night. I saw an advertisement about the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. It's entertaining. It wasn't particularly accurate, but uh, there was just uh, politicization, and and that that just goes with the territory. It can interfere with some clear-headed judgments the public would like to make. It's important for us to cut through with these kind of informative, no-nonsense, matter-of-fact uh, tools because ultimately, uh, whether somebody's trying to make political hay on one side of the aisle or another, people need to be able to make the choices about their lives, and that's what we're focused on. It's what we should be focused on. It's what we'll continue to focus on. All right, we're running long. Let me do a question for the lady about halfway back. Is that cookie? Yes, it is. Okay. Sorry. Hi, I'm Dr. Caroline Poplin. My late husband was Marty Slate, uh, director of the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation in the Clinton administration. My question is about security. The IRS is having an epidemic of ID theft, and I can tell you it bleeds over into Social Security. Um, are you aware of it, and are you doing something about it? Yes, we're certainly aware of the breaches that many governmental agencies are having. Uh, Social Security has not had a breach. Uh, 
we um, uh, take uh, very um, aggressive uh, steps to uh, ensure that the system is secure. We um, uh, have tests on a regular basis to determine where our vulnerabilities exist, and we correct them. Uh, we um, know that no uh, online system is 100% secure. Uh, I, um, so to say that Social Security may never have a breach, uh, I cannot say that to you. But I think it's also important relative to how an agency or organization responds if that breach should occur. But I will tell you that online services still proves to be much more secure than paper. Um, and um, we have um, certainly the data to reflect that. Uh, so I think it's something that you have to be attentive to. We spend a great deal of uh, time uh, testing our systems and ensuring that they are secure. Uh, and we've not had a problem to date. We, we get that question a lot at the Consumer Bureau. Of course, in our case, it's, it's typically de-identified, anonymized information. It's not very valuable to a hacker. It's valuable to researchers who want to know the direction of the economy or the direction of the consumer marketplace. It's not very valuable to somebody who wants to know your or my information because they can't even tell that it's your or my information. So, um, but uh, having said that, uh, I think we're all mindful of what we've seen and it's not at all unique to the federal government. As we know, it's in the private sector. It's, in, it's been true of some banks. It's, it's been true of uh, nonprofit organizations. Everybody's information is at some risk, and it behooves us all to be as careful as we can about it. So we're all, nobody's missing that point. Right. We have a panel of experts who I have importuned to come here. And so let us thank the commissioner thank and the director. And, yes. and before